All right, so uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be the first kind of academic speaking today. Uh, there will be some math in my talks, but hopefully we'll get through them uh, alive. All right, so I've titled my talk, Can One Algorithm Rule Them All? And I'd like to jump immediately and answer that question and say, no, not yet. But some tools can help. And what I'd like to show today is just how we can use some automatic computational techniques to really develop quick kind of iterative uh, model building techniques in machine learning. So let me go into this. First, let me acknowledge the incredible people I get to work with. This is Rajesh and Dustin, two amazing PhD students. And of course, Andrew and Dave. Andrew is speaking uh, later on today at this very conference. All right, so what is machine learning? Well, it's a form of data analysis where we want to discover and explore hidden patterns in data. The idea is that we want to study hard to see connections, predict future outcomes, and maybe explore causal relationships among other goals. So here's an example. It ties into Todd's example. Uh, this is a data set of taxi rides taken in, uh, over the cross of 2014 in the city of Porto. And uh, this is actual GPS information taken at every 15 seconds. So we actually have trajectories. And we're interested in seeing how people navigate the city uh, by car. So there's 1.7 million trips that we've clustered into groups that not only take a similar path through the city, but they also take a similar amount of time to get from source to destination. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this particular analysis at the end of my talk. So how do we use machine learning today? Well, we begin with data, and then we propose a statistical model. Now, these are very powerful. They allow us to make assumptions about the data that we're about to analyze, while also capturing uncertainties using the language of probability. Right? So celebrated models like regression, classification, mixture models, hidden Markov models, these all fall under this category. OK. So we have a model. We want to analyze some data. We give both of these to a machine learning expert, also known as a PhD student, <laughs> who spends months of her time trying to find these hidden patterns in the data. Right? Now, we're lucky in academia. We have access to this extremely you know, talented pool of students. But this is a problem. Right? We want machine learning to be easy to use, scalable, and flexible. And to that end, I argue that we should be developing automatic tools that we can give our experts to instantly extract these hidden patterns. So this is good. It relieves our talented people to do more interesting research and answer more interesting questions. But what it really enables is for us to close the modeling loop. We can now learn from the hidden patterns that we've extracted, revise our model, to dig deeper into our analysis and gain richer insights. Now, this isn't a novel vision. It dates back to the 60s. Statistical models are developed iteratively. We build a model, use it to analyze data, assess how it succeeds and fails, revise it, and repeat. Now, to realize this vision, we need access to efficient ways of cycling through this loop. So what do we need this automatic tool to do? To answer that question, let's look at what the machine learning expert is doing in that box. Well, she's doing inference. She's inferring the hidden patterns from the data. I'm going to split this into two sections, mathematical and algorithmic, for reasons that you'll see in a moment. So let's start putting some notation on the slides. For this talk, I'll be focusing on a class of models called Bayesian models. Bayesian models have two components. The first is the likelihood. This is a probability density that describes the observed data x conditioned on a particular hidden pattern, all right, p of x given theta. We combine this with the prior distribution, p of theta. This captures what kind of structure we expect from our hidden patterns. Combining these two things gives the joint, that's also called the model on the right-hand side. And I like to think of this as a data generating process, where x is the data that we've observed, but theta are these latent variables that capture the hidden patterns. So this is the part of the model that we would like to investigate having observed a data set. Now in the Bayesian setting, the mathematics of inference is straightforward. We want to compute the so-called posterior density 
This is a probability distribution over the hidden patterns theta given a data set. And its rule is given by Bayes' law. Right? Now, the posterior is precisely the object that we want. It tells us what the hidden patterns are and what our certainty about those estimates might be. Sadly, it's typically intractable. That integral that you see in the denominator is very high dimensional for modern models, and we need to approximate that distribution in some form. And this is where we're spending months of our time, finding a way of approximating this distribution. So there are two arguably main techniques, among others, of approximating the posterior. The first one is the classical sampling approach. So Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling falls under this category where we don't know what this posterior is, but we're going to build a Markov chain, run that for some time, and draw samples from the posterior. An alternative is to do variational inference, where we're going to directly approximate the posterior with a simpler function. Regardless of which approach you take, your computations depend heavily on the model. The moment that you make a small revision to your model, you might have to rederive lots of equations and re-implement a lot of code. So here are some common stat statistical computations that I want to equip you with some tools of solving automatically. So let's consider expectations. Expectations are kind of first-class citizens in, in Bayesian computation. We do, we compute them quite frequently. Expectations are integrals. So let's look at this particular form. We have the log of the model, and it's being integrated against Q of theta, which is this simpler function we use in variational inference to approximate the posterior. The statistically minded among you will recognize this as a cross entropy term. Now, if you don't know what log p is, because some user comes and defines a model and you just want to do inference with that model, you don't have a closed form for this, right? Even if, you, if p is simple, think back to your calculus days, calculating integrals are not always simple. At the very least, they're tedious. So let's say that this is an objective, that we want to optimize this expectation with respect to this function q. So I might want to calculate a gradient of that. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we can automate computations of gradients. And equipped with gradients, then I'll tell you how we can maximize these objective functions in kind of a general, uh, easy, kind of black box type way. So let's jump right into it. Expectations. So the technique I'll tell you about, some of you will probably be familiar with, it's called Monte Carlo sampling. It's a very simple idea, but it's very powerful. So here's a simplified case. Look at the plot on the left-hand side. This is a univariate function f defined over theta. And let's say I want to integrate f between a and b, right? An expectation is integral, so I want to calculate the area underneath that curve. Monte Carlo sampling says, draw some number of points between a and b uniformly, right? These are the points theta s that I've described there. Now, at each of these points, evaluate the function at those points. So now I have a set of f of theta s's, and I simply compute their empirical mean. So this kind of has an intuitive feeling of if you imagine that I continue sampling more and more points, I will get a more accurate estimate of this integral. It turns out that this technique gives us a unbiased estimate of these integrals and scales very well to high dimensions. So how do we apply this perspective to computing the integrals that I described in the previous slide? Well, the extension is actually really straightforward. Instead of drawing from a uniform distribution, we draw the thetas from Q. This is the distribution with respect to which we are taking an expectation. Right? So if we can sample from Q efficiently, I draw that, I evaluate log Px on theta s, and I take their empirical average. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. We've used this technique to great effect lately, and actually in many, many uh, different cases before this. And here are two kind of uh, citations that you might find helpful if you want to dig into it. And I'll put these up at the very end of my talk as well, so you can grab them at that point as well. So how would you implement this? Uh, I'm ashamed to say that I'm, I'm agnostic in terms of languages, so I'm going to just put down a bunch of examples in whichever language you prefer. And these are going to be um, in, you know, incomplete lists of options you might have. 
So in C++, you might use the sand math library. In Python, NumPy, SciPy have lots of ways of drawing from probability distributions. And you can find kind of what works for you and implement these very simply. OK, so let's move on to gradients. Symbolic or automatic differentiation are two ways of exactly computing gradients without having to do any manual calculations. So let me walk you through an example of how this works. Let's say that we have some function f of x1, x2, and it has this form, log, some product, and a sign. And if we were to implement this and ask for a computer to evaluate it at, let's say, points 2 comma 5, then the following would happen, right? We would set 2, 5, and then we would move through the computational trace in some sense. So we'd compute log of 2, we'd compute the product, we'd compute sine of 5, and then we would add the first two elements and subtract the third one from that result. Now, if we were to do automatic differentiation, for instance, and this is the so-called forward mode of automatic differentiation, we could compute a partial derivative of this function with respect to x1 while we're actually evaluating the function. So on the right-hand side, I set x1 to 1. I want a partial derivative with respect to x1, x2 to 0. And I follow with the derivatives of each step. So the derivative of a log is 1 over x, right? The derivative of a product, we have that rule appearing there as well. And the derivative of the sine shows up as the cosine. And then we plug these things together to get 5.5 as the answer. So this really is a game changer. Let me show you how simple it is to code this up in C++ at least with Stan, right? I declare two Stan math variables, x1, x2. I set them to 2 and 5 describe another variable, f, and I encode the function just as we wrote mathematically. And then I call f.grad. And if I were to run this script, you would get the answers that we got in the previous slide. So I want to highlight that these sorts of libraries are available for many languages and many different flavors exist of these. So I think that if you find yourself that you're computing uh, derivatives frequently for functions that might be changing, like models and things like that, then you might want to include these in your algorithms or at least in your workflow so that you're not hand-deriving gradients. OK, so the last topic I want to talk about is stochastic optimization. So you'll note that because the integral that we're estimating is not exact, it has some variance, the gradients of those expectations are going to be noisy. They're unbiased, but they're noisy. Now, with stochastic optimization techniques, we can follow these noisy gradients to a local optimum of our objective function. The idea is we take small steps along these gradients not to go too far in the wrong direction. So here's a great plot from Kevin's textbook. Uh, the global optimum here is the red x, and we initialize somewhere to the left. And each of those circles are iterations that we've taken. These are steps that we've taken. And you can see that in many cases, we actually take steps in the wrong direction. But we recover by, uh, from those wrong steps, and we're guaranteed to actually reach a local optimum using stochastic optimization techniques. Another advantage of this is that we can scale up to tall data sets using stochastic optimization techniques. It's really a natural way Every single time that we compute these gradients, we only look at a subset of the data set. So that's how, for instance, how we scaled that taxi analysis, which is just a million data points in contrast to Todd's billion. But in academia, a million is a big number. Um, we were able to fit that in a single day using this kind of subsampling strategy. I'll talk about that briefly. Now, stochastic optimization, there are also libraries that you can plug in and use in whatever language that you prefer. Uh, and here, you might want to do a little bit more kind of digging if you want to implement something uh, from scratch, which is actually what we did um, in Stan. OK, so I'd like to tell you just briefly about an algorithm that we developed using these techniques. It's called Automatic Differentiation Variational Inference. It's an easy to use, scalable, and flexible algorithm, just like we intended to develop. And we built this into STAN, 
So I presume you'll, hopefully some people are familiar with Stan here. If not, you'll be hearing more about it during this conference. Stan is a probabilistic programming system. What that allows you to do is to write a model in a simple text file. Right? It almost looks like pure mathematics. Then you provide some data and you press a button. Stan provides a suite of inference algorithms ranging from sampling to optimization, and now variational inference is one option that you have to choose from there. And we have extensions to RStan, PyStan, all the good kind of stuff. So let me tell you a little bit about how we got these results. Remember, we have a data set of two-dimensional trajectory information every 15 seconds. Right? So this was, I don't remember the exact number, but it was a few gigabytes of data. And it's actually rather high dimensional, because if you have a very long trip that takes, I don't know, 40, 50 minutes, you have very long trajectories because you have latitude, longitude information at every 15 seconds. So here's how we got to these results. We took our own medicine, and we did an iterative modeling cycle. So the first thing that we did is we wrote down a probabilistic principal component analysis model. What this is is a model that seeks a low-dimensional subspace that captures much of the variability in our high-dimensional data set. And we want to do this because we're just exploring the data at this point. All right? I don't want to work on this extraordinary data, si data set. I want to project it down to a low-dimensional subspace. So I wrote the model down. I used ADVI to infer the subspace, no math, no code. Right? I projected the data down into the subspace and ran a mixture model analysis to find these clusters. Now, the clusters that we found weren't really informative because some trips were very short, some were very long, and even though they were geographically clustered, they were taking similar routes, they weren't really telling a kind of intuitive story. So we went back and we revised our probabilistic PCA model to be a supervised model. The idea here is that we're now looking for a low dimensional subspace while regressing on the duration of a trip. So that's where the traffic information comes in. This gives us a different subspace. We repeated the entire process, and that's how we got those results. Now, I'm not claiming that this is the best way of analyzing traffic data or doing urban planning or anything like that. But what is key here is that we are able to do this analysis in a single day. And anyone who's worked with models like this before will know that this would have taken an expert at least a few weeks to do. All right, so I'm a bit early. I do have some extra slides if you guys have questions. But I'd like to end with reiterating that we want to develop automatic tools to make inference easy to use. And these are the citations. You can find my website there and a link to Stan in the middle. Thank you. <laughs>